So everybody, thanks so much for joining us. I always love when you're here live. Um, it's, it's so great to have the interaction and we're going to leave time at the end of this. And believe me, I am as much a student of this as you guys are. Uh, Brundy is just, we had a great connection when we first started talking and everything. Um, okay, John, no problem. You'll get the replay. And everything, we just kept talking and talking and talking. And I said, you must come on and do a webinar from, from my tribe here. So before we get started, I'm going to literally read her bio because I don't want to mess things up. And if you don't know me, my name is Kathy, Kathy Biasse. I'm a holistic nutritionist and I'm a cancer coach. And I'm the founder of the online platform, Cancer Canopy Learning. Um, so yeah, so that's all you need to know about me because this is about Brandy. So here's her bio. So when Brandy Brody's infant son, Brody, right? I got okay, it. Okay, I got it this time. Her infant son experienced an onslaught of health issues that conventional medicine couldn't define or treat. So she began her own research-based quest for answers. And over the course of 10 years, she pulled together hundreds of threads from scientific journal articles and revealed the importance of the enzyme calcium ATPase. So I had never heard of this until I met Brundy. So Brundy has a Hale, a, Hale, a Yale MBA and has received patents in both the United States and China related to her work on calcium ATPase. And she has written the book, and we will try and get this out to as many of you as possible, uh, The Calcium Connection, the little known enzyme at the root of your cellular health. And she is here with us today to share her knowledge because this impacts us all, okay? Whether you're part of the Cancer Canopy Learning Community, and if you're not, by the way, join our Facebook group, because this is a prevention platform as well as an active care platform. So I encourage you to come and talk with us. Um, and I'll leave that at that. Uh, it's, it's just, we both have this, this synergistic idea that we just wanna help people. And so Brandy is going to take over the show um, and, and just educate us about what calcium ATPase is, uh, how this is relevant in health, disease, and then we're going to go down um, that avenue of cancer prevention. So all encompassing, I don't want to take up too much of the time. This isn't like a PowerPoint, so I will be interjecting here. I won't leave you standing on your own. So Brandy, welcome yes, to hi. our Thank webinar. You. Thank you for having me, Kathy. I'm awesome. It's awesome to be here. Well, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. And thank you for sharing all of your knowledge with us. And as with so many things, um, people that are wanting and willing and inspirational and influential have a backstory um, and yours is your son's. So maybe you could talk, you know, weave it all together, how this all happened, what calcium ATPase is. Um, how it relates to calcium, and then we'll talk about disease, disease prevention, and, and all that stuff. Okay, sure. So I'm just going to start with the story of my son, because this is how it all began. But so basically, you know, I went through a normal birth, but I had the lidocaine, and he was put in the ICU an hour after he was born with breathing problems, and um, ultimately they diagnosed sleep apnea. I didn't know at the time that lidocaine was a very potent calcium ATPase inhibitor and that other children who were other children that had the similar apnea and oxygen deprivation. So, so to make a long story short, he came home. And of course, this was 20 years ago. I didn't know anything. So I'd had his nursery painted. I'd had the carpets torn up. The floor is redone. He was on formula. He was, you know, they, he was drinking out of a bisphenol laden bottle. I didn't know any of this, but all I knew was he continued to have a lot of problems, which included like swallowing problems. He was getting fluid into his lungs. He had pneumonia. He had to have nebulizer treatments four times a day. He had muscle issues where his eyelids drooped. He was just droopy. He ended up once he started eating regular foods, having these horrible rashes. Um, and then also there was mood issues, which, you know, when they're a baby, you realize it's not because you screwed up. There's not enough time for that. There's something going on physiologically. Um, so, you know, so I took them to the doctors and they ran all the normal tests, you know, myasthenic gravis for his muscles, metabolic disease, food allergies, um, they, they just didn't have any answers and his problems just were not going away. So I, I kind of was just really determined because I was so upset, obviously. And I began really watching how 
what he ate and the environment he was affected to affected his symptoms. And one of the easiest ones to, to monitor was his muscles because you could really see if his eyelids were drooping over half of his uh, pupil, if he was really droopy, that was something I could actually see objectively. So, and he was negative for the traditional muscle test. So I looked into muscle function and I found that the calcium regulation within muscle cells was really important. So separate from this, I began to know things that he was sensitive to that made his symptoms worse. And one of them was a, when he ate foods with the additive TBHQ. To make a long story short, I went on PubMed, which is this journal, this, this place, this wonderful place online that has all the scientific journal articles for the last 50 years and typed in TBHQ and calcium regulation. And sure enough, it inhibited this enzyme, which I had never heard of which you've probably never heard of. It's called calcium ATPase. And what I found out was that it inhibited this enzyme, which would affect his calcium regulation. And then ultimately I found out that everything he was sensitive to inhibited this enzyme calcium ATPase. And by reducing his exposure to these things, I mean, I'm talking about fire retardants from the jumpy pit at the local YMCA, YMCA to, you know, tricks yogurt with the food dyes. I mean, there were so many things he was being exposed to, but by really eliminating all those things, his symptoms really improved. And that doesn't mean he had a reduction in calcium ATPase. It just means he was sensitive to things that inhibited calcium ATPase. And ultimately I learned that calcium ATPase was important, not just to canoe, but to all kids because it really affected neurite growth development and neural pathways. And then from there, I began to, to find out that low levels were associated with all the diseases we wanna avoid. Cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, um, Parkinson's, uh, inflammation, just so I, I kind of like thought like, okay, I know all this, there's 25,000 journal articles backing me up, but nobody knows this. So my goal in this seminar, this webinar, and in my book is simply to put calcium ATPase on people's radar so they know it's an important factor in health. So we know that calcium, well, most of us know that we have calcium in our body, and we think of calcium when we think of bones. Right. Um, now, two-pronged here. Can you explain the action of an enzyme to everybody and then explain where the calcium that we're speaking about is actually located? Okay, so um, j just, j just so you know, I had no idea that calcium ATPase or calcium in the cells existed. So calcium, you usually think of bones and teeth, and that's totally correct. In fact, there's 2.2 pounds of calcium in our body and most of that is in your bones and teeth and ligaments. There's just one and one half teaspoons that's found in your bloodstream and in your cells. So you may say, why is that important? Well, in every cell of the body, the rise and fall of calcium levels act as a traffic signal for cell events. So for example, in muscle cells, when calcium levels rise, that causes a muscle contraction. So if you contract your bicep, that, that calcium levels are going up. But to relax it, calcium levels need to go down. And the way the body maintains the regulation of calcium within the cells is this, the primary way, is this enzyme called calcium ATPase. So just to break it down, calcium just means that's what it's involved with. ATP is just the energy it runs off of. As we know, ATP is the energy molecule for the body, or maybe you don't know, I didn't know before. So calcium ATP and ACE, it just simply means it's an enzyme. So what calcium ATPase does, after calcium ATPase levels rise within the cells, its job is to lower it back down to baseline. And it does this by pumping calcium from the cytoplasm of the cell, the, the the most the, kind of the most obvious part of the cell into these storage compartments within the cell. And what that does is two things. It brings calcium levels within the cell back to normal and it stores calcium. So the next time you need to contract your muscles, there's calcium available to make that happen. Um, so Kathy, you have to help me. I'm not sure. <laughs> I kind of, you have to tell me where I'm at or what, I, what else I need to answer. Nope. Um, 
Okay, let's talk about then the functions of calcium outside muscle contraction, because I think this will then lead into how not having a well regulated enzyme is going to impact our health. Sure. So like I mentioned, the rise of calcium ATPase is like a green traffic light. It means neurotransmitters are released. It means muscles are contracted. It means the heart contracts to, to, to pump. It means that, um, that, I mean, just every single action in your body, it means your stomach churns. It means your colon moves food down through it. It, it. The rise of calcium is crucial to every single cell function. So it's not bad. It's a, it's a good thing, mm -hmm. but you need to, at some point, the signal needs to stop and that's where calcium ATPase is. So as a metaphor, which I think might be really helpful because a lot of this may be kind of going in one ear, not the other, is that calcium levels within the cells are like traffic signals. So if you can imagine if the traffic signals in the city aren't working, right? There's gonna be mayhem, a lot of different kinds of mayhem. So when calcium ATPase is not able to, if there's not enough and it's not able to regulate calcium, it basically means the traffic signals in your body aren't working. And that just leads to a host of different problems throughout your body. As you can imagine in a city, some are really dramatic, like there might be an accident, some are peripheral, like, your kid might miss the orthodontist appointment and then the ortho orthodontist may not get their paycheck, which means they miss their rent. I mean, so there's just a lot of different effects, both primary and secondary. So when you don't have enough calcium ATP, it's as if it's triggering traffic cell dysfunction. So I think that lays out a very good baseline for everybody. And type in your questions if you have any, because I want to make sure you guys get this because it's important. Um, the overriding issue is, is that if we don't have enough of the enzyme, if calcium is not regulated properly, it can lead into downstream issues, cycling into disease. So when we're talking about if we're going to go specifically into the area of cancer, and I know you're not a cancer expert, but there's logistics in all of this as to why it, this lack of an enzyme may be involved. Uh, in some tumorogenesis uh, for many reasons from uh, nutrition when you were talking about um, not having the nutrients to be able to be absorbed because things are slowing down in the gastrointestinal tract and right. all of this stuff. So, but you have done some research specifically in this area of cancer and, and Brandy wanted me to make it vastly clear to you all that she's not a specialist in the area of cancer, but again, we can extrapolate from the work she's done and she can point out in some specific areas how dysregulation of this enzyme and therefore calcium can play a role in certain cancers. So, right. So I just want to take this side note to say Kathy is, is the expert and she has a lot of- <laughs> Not in this. <laughs> knowledge and <laughs> Um, but in terms of what I know and what I can offer is simply this, the calcium regulation plays a major role in cell differentiation and proliferation. And you may or may not know that those are two things that go awry in cancer. The cells do not differentiate properly and they proliferate too much. So you end up having these cells that aren't differentiated, going crazy and proliferating and taking over normal cells. So what I do know is that calcium regulation plays a major role in that. And when calcium regulation is, dysregulation, is dysregulated, problems occur. So just, just some data points is that um, low levels of calcium ATPase are associated with colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, and skin cancer. So it's not clear whether or not that's a result of cancer or the triggering event of cancer. But what is clear is that calcium dysregulation is part of cancer. The second data point is that people that have genetic um, alterations and the gene that is responsible for calcium ATPase 
have a higher incidence of cancer. So what seems to happen is if you have low calcium ATPase, you're more susceptible to cancer. So the net net is that you want your calcium regulation to be optimal. And in order for it to be optimal, you want to have your calcium ATPase levels at their optimal levels. So, you know, we don't have all the exact reasons why, but we do know that much. Okay. And that's, so, that's really what I have to, to add to the equation. So we're not sure if it's, a, if it's the initiator of cancer or if it's a byproduct of the cancer process, but somewhere in there, it is involved. So no straight links as to why right now. Right. I mean, you know, there's such a mix in the research. Some people say it's a, the triggering event for, for tumors and which and else then ends up making them be able to proliferate. Um, other people say it's a byproduct. So it's kind of one of those things. And then another twist, which I hate to add twist, but I want to be honest and straightforward. So there's a substance called thapsogargan, which they use in studies to inhibit calcium ATPase, and that's a tumor promoter, which would seem to indicate that reduced calcium ATPase encourages tumor. But at the other end of the spectrum, if you have really, really, really low calcium ATPase, it causes cell death. So they're actually using the same substance, only targeted to cancer cells to cause them cell death. So it, it's all that we know is that calcium regulation plays a role in the start of cancer and also to try to, to get rid of the cancer. But, but one other point I'll add, which is not very fully developed, is that there's been studies that have shown that chemotherapy resistance is associated with reduced calcium ATPase. So there's some evidence that by taking supplements that stimulate calcium ATPase, it can prevent this chemotherapy resistance. So again, I'm not an expert in cancer, but I can, I can totally solidly say that calcium regulation is important and you wanna make sure that it's optimal. And calcium ATPase is important. Which is going to lead us obviously on ways to optimize it if possible. Um, now, there's a question here. And again, understand everyone that uh, Brandy is not a cancer expert here. But the question is, is excess calcium in the blood a sign of a low ATPase enzyme? No, it's not, but it is often a sign of cancer because what happens is if, if you have bone cancer, it breaks down the calcium, it, it causes the calcium within the bones to be broken down, which ends up causing something called hypercalcemia, which is mm -hmm. high calcium in the blood. Um, conversely, some cancers end up causing low calcium in the blood, but neither of those have anything to do with calcium ATPase in particular. Okay. Um, all yeah. right, so this next question of a chemotherapy medication that depletes calcium is along that path. It's got right, so it doesn't, it doesn't, um, so just as a kind of an underlying fact, the calcium level in the bloodstream is much higher than the calcium level within the cells. And, and so that's a gradient that's, that's kept pretty steady. So, um, you know, it would take a very big variation with higher calcium or lower calcium to throw off that gradient, but it's, it's not a primary. I mean, if you take calcium supplements, it doesn't stimulate calcium ATPase. If you're deficient in calcium, it doesn't reduce calcium ATPase. So they're kind of separate things, which I know is super confusing. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. It can be. So again, we're going to go back to this point that we're talking about calcium ATPase, and correct me if I'm wrong in all this, sure. calcium ATPase as an enzyme for the control of calcium within the cells. Okay, exactly. so we're not talking about calcium in the bones or calcium in, in the blood. They're different mechanisms. Yeah. Okay, so this begs the question, as far as I'm concerned, most of us, maybe some of, of our, our webinar attendees have heard of it. I had not heard of it. Why haven't we heard about this? Why isn't there a blood test? Why isn't there anything that we have pointing us to this? 
Yeah, well, that's a fascinating question. So especially because there's like 25,000 studies that have been done over the last 50 years that look at calcium ATPase, both in terms of heart, cancer, every single health disease you can think of, and also all these things that make it worse or, or lower its levels. Um, in terms of why it's not widely known, I have no idea. Um, because it's such a fundamental pillar of health, but that's, that's changing because as pharmaceutical companies begin to realize the importance of it, of course, that means there's going to be uh, attention paid. But um, in terms of a test, there's easy tests that are done in research studies, right? How do you know that calcium ATPase levels are reduced in patients that are obese? You take their blood. You look at their blood plasma levels of calcium ATPase. It's not that complicated. Or you look at them, you take a muscle biopsy, look at calcium ATPase in the muscles. There, there's certainly straightforward ways to do this, but there's not a current way. But I am working to change that. I'm working with a company to develop a test. And, you know, in an ideal world, you'd be able to go to your doctor, and that would be one of the things you test with as long, you know, as well as cholesterol, A1C. Um, all those normal things. So hopefully that's close by. But in the meantime, A1C levels are inversely correlated with calcium ATPase, which means the higher your A1C, the lower your calcium ATPase. So, Another, so A1C blood sugar A1C levels? Blood sugar levels, and it's blood sugar levels over time. And, and the reason why um, this may be too much information, but A1C measures the glycation of hemoglobin. And what glycation means is when the sugar molecule attaches to the protein. So what happens with calcium ATPase is very similar to hemoglobin. It's a protein and high blood sugar, the sugar and high blood sugar attaches and glycates the, the calcium ATPase very similar to hemoglobin. So it makes sense if the high blood sugar is glycating hemoglobin, it's also glycating calcium ATPase. Um, so that, that's one thing. Another thing is LDL cholesterol. So it's, it's the higher your LDL, but well, that's not fair. LDL inhibits calcium ATPase in the heart. So in addition to clogging your arteries, right, we know that it also actually affects calcium ATPase as an enzyme. Um, the other kind of ballpark estimates is that obesity is inversely correlated with calcium ATPase. So the more obese you are, likely to lower your calcium ATPase. And um, also diabetes is, is the same situation as well as high blood pressure. So, you know, it, it makes sense. They all go together, mm -hmm. but hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully in the next year, you'll have a test that you can get taken because this really should be part of what's offered um, to everybody. It's, it's, we have somebody here said that what's interesting to her is that while she was going through cancer treatment for lymphoma, this blood test was part of her panel before chemo uh, with no explanation ever given. So she wouldn't have known to ask about it. So wow. interestingly That's, enough, it was part I mean, of her yeah. panel. I mean, that is... That's fascinating. I'd like, it is fascinating. I'd like, I'd like uh, yeah. I, um, Dora, are you from Canada or are you in the States, Doris? Um, so the, where, where was I going? Inflammation seems to be uh, the underlying issue. So again, inflammation, and we've talked about inflammation on so many different fronts. Right. Inflammation it seems to be a logical step to why this enzyme is um, inhibited. Yeah, so it's... Um, yeah, so it's one of those things that reduced calcium ATPase triggers just by itself without any antigen or virus triggering it. It actually triggers mast cell degranulation. So what's mast cell degranulation? Mm -hmm. It's when your cells release, particular cells called mast cells release these inflammatory mediators, which are like histamine, which you probably know, like Benadryl mm -hmm. block histamine, there's leukotrienes you know, like, you know, nasocort, different, there's, there's a number of different inflammatory mediators that are released when mast cells degranulate. So just by itself, low calcium ATPase triggers inflammation. But what's even worse is that when you have an antigen, for example, when you're allergic to cat dander, your body responds by mast cell degranulation, but low calcium ATPase makes your mast cells, it magnifies their allergic response. 
So it not only causes inflammation without any trigger, when, when a trigger does occur, it makes, it magnifies that trigger. And would then, this have any impact on um, anaphylactic? Uh, yeah, I mean, it would definitely, if you have low calcium HPAs, it would definitely would make an anaphylactic response worse. It would definitely magnify. Could it cause, do you think, an anaphylactic? I mean, I, I think it would be, um, like, like, for example, my son, when he got bit by a mosquito, he would get a bump the size of a silver dollar, right? Mm -hmm. So like, like he was overreactive to everything. Um, so in terms of, but he didn't have just random anaphylactic responses. So, so I can't really speak to that. But mm -hmm. what I do know is that when he was, was exposed to things that reduce his calcium HPs, his allergic response was way over the, I mean, an amp bite it would be a welt. Um, so if you have allergies, low calcium ATPase is definitely making them worse. And if you don't have allergies, kind of the chronic reduced levels of calcium ATPase could be causing inflammation without any reason. Interesting. Um, well, yeah. I, I've just been, you know, I had um, on my, the radio show, I had someone on to talk about mast cell syndrome, which again was something I'd never right. heard of. So right. obviously these things are starting to come to the forefront yeah. and there are connections. Yeah. So is there, okay, so let's go down this road then. Um, okay, so someone has asked, I'm taking calcium, a, a perfect segue into what we're just going to talk about. I'm taking calcium and vitamin D. Is this enough to create, increase the ATPA enzyme? Um, so let's talk about now, the, the happy place of all of this is that we can work to increase this enzyme. Uh, until we have a blood test we can get or some you know reliable way to to get a, a marker it's it's going to be I guess how you feel how you know how that will get a sort of a, a benchmark if this is working but you, you have ways and you have hope and you have um, pathways that you're going to tell us about to help us to at least get our ATPase enzyme where we want it to be so let's start talking yeah. about that Okay, sure. So just to re in response to the question, um, you know, there's kind of been mixed evidence about vitamin D. I don't really know about vitamin D. So I wish I did, but I don't know. And, and calcium supplement supplementation doesn't really affect calcium ATPs directly. Um, but in terms of things you think can do, there's four pathways. One is to avoid toxins. And I'll go into more of that in a minute to give you some specific specifics, but just in general, you know, the ones you know about mercury, lead, pesticide, food additives, food preservatives, um, you know, just, just a wide range of kind of your typical toxins that you know about, but there's some kind of sneaky ways they, they come in, which I'll, I'll give you a couple of those. The second way is nutrition. And the key, one key way, which I've kind of alluded to before is high blood sugar. So blood sugar, high blood sugar, the sugar glycates the calcium ATPase and disables it. So in general, try to avoid periods of high blood sugar. That doesn't mean you're not gonna have the birthday cake or splurge, but just, you know, on a daily basis, you don't wanna be hitting the high blood sugar mark, you know, regularly, you know. So there's lots of different ways to deal with that, keto, paleo, Mediterranean, or just simply moderate carbohydrate consumption. So blood sugar is one part of it. The other part, which is kind of exciting, is that there's these compounds in fruits and vegetables that actually have been shown to stimulate calcium ATPase. And a lot of them are things I'm sure that Kathy recommends in her <laughs> diet plan. But when what's also kind of fascinating, so these these foods contain a number of compounds. One is resveratrol, one is lutololin, one is elegic acid, one is lipocene, one is alpha lipoic acid, one is taurine. And what's fascinating about this is all these things have been shown to stimulate calcium ATPase, but they also have been shown to be beneficial both in cancer prevention and some in tumor progression. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'll, you know, off the top, I'll give you just kind of the, the big picture berries, you know, 
all different kinds of nuts, um, tomatoes, celery, um, pomegranates, um, you know, red verdicchio, red kale, uh, red kale, spinach, uh, sunflower seeds. I mean, I'm kind of randomly eating this, but I told Kathy at the beginning of this, I am going to enable you guys to, to download the nutrition chapter. And what's great about that, it has each compound and it has a list of the key foods that have it. And then also there's these recipes that each recipe has between three and seven of these compounds. So, um, and, and, and I think it's really helpful to really see that it's not just, oh, eat fruits and vegetables, but, oh, you know what? These things target calcium ATPase. So I, th I think it kind of gives you a kind of a target um, mm -hmm. that's helpful. So, okay, so there's avoid toxins, there's nutrition, there's exercise, which you know we all know is important, but the good news again is that exercise stimulates calcium ATPase and it does no matter what your age, because everybody as you age, the calcium ATPase levels decline in your muscles. Um, but the great news is that high intensity interval training or for people that prefer moderate aerobics or people that like strength training, all three have been shown in research studies to stimulate calcium ATPase in the muscles and in the heart. And um, the last area is stress reduction. Of course, we all know, <laughs> we've all heard <laughs> a million times that stress reduction is good, but I'm giving you one more specific reason and that is stress hormones called catecholamines actually inhibit calcium ATPase. So you don't want those levels to be super high all the time because that's gonna have a negative effect on calcium ATPase. So the great news is that yoga, meditation, Tai Chi, um, a lot of different traditional stress reduction approaches have been shown to actually reduce these particular stress hormones. But the truth of the matter is, whatever makes you feel relaxed is positive. So there's these standard ways, but my, my suggestion is to pay attention to what works for you. And it could be something that nobody else understands, but to the extent that you can add to your day or every other day, any moments where it takes away stress, that can only be good for your calcium ATPase. So these are the pillars of health and right. they're, they're applicable in so many different areas. Um, are there things, you know, we talked about blood sugar and right. excessive um, sugar intake. Are there other things, not just the, the stress, the things that are outside. Right. So we talked about genetic components. Are right. there other things that can um, cause a severe decrease in calcium ATPase? Um, you know, so the, the main thing in terms of what can actually trigger it you know, just kind of in a systemic way is high blood sugar, but, you know, things like aluminum. So you might think, oh, I don't have aluminum, but if you cook with aluminum foil with lemons, like a lot of fish recipes are, you know, foil packets with lemon on top. Well, the acidic nature of lemon makes the aluminum leach into food or barbecue sauce, for example, on the grill with, or just charring your food. We all know benzopyranes are bad for cancer, but they also are a potent inhibitor of calcium ATPase. Another one is bisphenol. So we all kind of know in general bisphenol is bad, but one of the reasons why it's bad is it inhibits calcium ATPase. And sometimes it can kind of sneak into your life like wonton soup, you get to go, <laughs> is in these plastic containers. So my advice to you is at least dump it out as soon as it comes, you know, because the heat causes the bisphenol to leach into the food. Um, just another example, which may seem counterintuitive, which is really interesting, is that titanium dioxide and zinc oxide and oxybenzone, all are like key ingredients used in sunscreen. Yeah. Well, all those ingredients inhibit calcium ATPase in the epithelial cells. So what's fascinating is, it, although maybe you guys are kind of in my age group and especially the group. 10 or 15 years younger, we've all been like using sunscreens, right? And our body lotion mm -hmm. and our moisturizers and our base and our, you know, concealer. And then on top of that, more sunscreen. And you would think that that would lead to lower skin cancer 
numbers. But in fact, people in the age group of 30 to 60 have a greater increase in skin cancer than any other group, both squamous and melanoma. So, so my point is just that now titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are natural sunscreens, right? And we've been told that, and that's true. But the nanoparticle version has a negative effect on calcium ATPase. But the great news is there's a lot of products now that are non-nanoparticle that also don't look like toothpaste. So that, that's kind of... <laughs> That's the issue. Yeah, right yeah. So that's, that's, you know, so I would, you know, so that's one little way um, that you can make a change that you probably wouldn't have thought of, or even like another thing is Trident or Orbit sugarless gum, right? You think, okay, well, sugarless is white. What could be the big deal about it? But it contains titanium dioxide nanoparticles that you're actually ingesting. Um, so there's kind of these little things that you don't really realize that are part of your everyday life. Or for example, kind of the buttons on your, on your blouses that kind of look like gold, obviously they're not gold. Um, there's been studies that show a lot of them contain a high level of cadmium, which is a toxic um, calcium ATPase inhibitor. So that really becomes a problem if you have a toddler who's sucking on your buttons. So there's kind of like a lot of different ways these these external things sneak in that you're not aware of. And um, in my book, I give you checklists of each toxin. And, you know, the reality is you can't do them all at once. Mm -hmm. um, but every single one you do is positive for your calcium ADPA. So, you know, I, I, I just encourage you if you get the book to look at the list and, you know, take one toxin at a time and, you know, do the best you can. But whatever you do is helpful. Uh, but I think it's important to know where your exposure is. And that's really what I've tried to give you in my book. And it, it is important because we don't realize sometimes. Uh, I never these are, uh, Well, um, most of us didn't. Yeah. You know, I, you grow into these things. And yeah. like I said earlier, unless you are uh, actively looking to improve your health and ways to, to, you know, shore up different areas, you may not be thinking of these things. Yeah, and just um, so you, you don't have to run naked around the store, the outside mm -hmm. aisles of the store, but right. you, you do have to be um, aware. Yeah, I mean, it just helps. I mean, just one thing I didn't know is that so tuna usually, a lot of tuna is pretty low in mercury, but sushi grade tuna is super high in mercury. Like if you have one roll, that's as much mercury as you're supposed to have like for a month. So, you know, so like because tuna grade sushi, the tuna is so big and the larger the fish, the more mercury they, they have. So, you know, it's like if you, if you love sushi, that's great. You know, try to, try to be moderate in your tuna, you know, tuna sushi. There's, you know, salmon sushi is good, shrimp sushi, scallop sushi, you know, all those. But, but I, I never knew that. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that, that you just never thought of you know, it, in the bottom line is it all adds up. So it's not that you have to be perfect all the time, but just an awareness of, of the choices you're making in, in total is what I'm after, just mm -hmm. so you can be aware. Simple changes day to day. Everyone's heard this, you know, leveling on nutrition, uh, small changes. Environmentalworkinggroup.org is wonderful yeah. for yeah. Um, finding out uh, toxins and things and, and, yeah. and good products that you can use on your body, bad products that, um, you know, that you should yeah, keep they're, away. They're, they're great. And they have that, you know, dirty dozen, which is yeah. the, is the highest pest. And then that's just another thing, pesticides, all pesticides and hippie calcium HPs, including things like Raid, you know, Lysex, your dog's flea collar. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to be very, um, you know, moderate use of pesticides and the good news is just, there's a lot of um, options now available at home depot even well you know what i think and especially at this time where we're doing a whole lot of online stuff and people are have the time to learn and people are demanding better quality people are demanding more and you're seeing that because the stores have more organic the stores have so you're seeing that people are becoming educated yeah. and now they're demanding a higher quality now, before I want to end off with asking you how your son is doing, but um, have you ever looked into any type of chelating therapies for heavy metals and things like you that? Know, I don't know much about that, but okay. it can only be good if you do have 
or if you suspect you have high levels of aluminum, mercury, lead, cadmium, um, fluoride, um, to the extent that those um, processes reduce those levels, it can only be good. I don't know about those in particular. In particular. So chelation, everybody, is, is basically something that chelates to the heavy metals and takes them out. And there are different chelating agents for different metals. I've actually, um, totally out of the blue, have been looking into binders and things like that that can also help to take toxins out of the system. And I think it's, uh, I think it's been a missing piece in my practice is working with binders. Um, I'm certainly not, I can't do chelation therapy, but I mean, for everybody else out there, you know, if this is something that you're interested in, you can certainly go down that path and talk to a, a practitioner of it, about it. But binders um, are something it that may, I'm it working makes, in. Yeah, it makes total sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it just makes sense to get the toxins out. It does. Sweating it out, saunas, yeah. exercising, probably yeah. high intensity yeah. sweat is also an, yeah. a, a good thing to do. And how is your son doing? He's doing great. He's 20. He's almost finishing up his sophomore year in college. And, you know, he still has to be careful because when he has a lot of exposure, eats a lot of foods, he doesn't feel good and things just don't work. So um, he's really learned to um, maneuver that. And that doesn't mean he's perfect, but, you know, he's moderate and occasional offs um, and he's doing great. He's happy and strong and healthy and, um, a great kid. Excellent. Does anyone have questions? We have 15 minutes and I like to leave about 15 minutes at the end to see if there are any questions. Um, anything else, Brenda, you wanted to get out to everybody before um, we call it a, a webinar? Um, no, I, I just think what I'm trying to communicate is that there's just kind of this aspect of health that we don't know about mm -hmm. that um, is important which is calcium ATPase and calcium regulation. And um, it's really important to all different, if, if you don't have enough, you're susceptible to a lot of different diseases. So hopefully this is added to your knowledge and, um, and I'm excited. And again, it's, uh, you know, when I, I'm working with, with cancer patients and we're on the, the cancer canopy platform, I profess as you do, it's, it's, little things every day that continue to make the the biggest difference and when it comes to stuff like this again this is so you know when you're working in cancer when i when i'm working with cancer patients i'm working on the health for for many reasons one of them being it's a controllable piece and this is a controllable piece of course if there's a genetic issue um, it's, it's, you know, there are other things going on at play, but Brundy's giving you a ton of information of how you can just go about. And although, as we talked about, we don't have a blood test that you can go and really check your levels right now, at least you can know you're, you're feeding yourself the right way to help with this enzyme. We have a question. Can you please repeat the point about the relationship between A1C and the enzyme calcium ATPase? Sure. So the higher your A1C, which means the more your hemoglobin is glycated, which is bad because it, it's basically a measurement of how high your blood sugar is over time. So like it's a about blood three sugar, months, right? Yeah. Something so blood like sugar, yeah. Blood sugar test tells you what it is in the moment, but the A1C tells you over time how high your blood sugar was. And the way it does is, is by looking at the protein hemoglobin and how much of it is glycated. So what they found in people, I mean, there's been a, studies that show that the level of A1C is inversely correlated with calcium ATPase levels, which makes sense. The higher A1C, which means the more glycated of the protein you have, the lower your calcium ATPase, which essentially means your calcium ATPase is being disabled. So the net net and what to learn from it is that high blood sugar is bad for your hemoglobin. It's also bad for your calcium ATPase because it glycates it. Okay. Um, can you please repeat some of the foods that you can get to improve calcium ATPase? Sure. So berries, so strawberries, blueberries, cranberries, raspberries, cranberries are all good. Um, nuts, almonds pecans, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, pine nuts, um, vegetables, um, tomatoes, red kale, asparagus, 
and I'm not going to remember all these. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll be in and, the in the, and, the chapter. The, you, you guys will get the download, and there's list of all these. Um, you know, and also there's the research behind it. So if you don't get it all now, it's all there. It's all there. And I will try and figure out a way to get you the books that are coming. Um, that'll be in a thought process of mine. Where can people order your book? It's out, right? Right. Yeah. So it's out and, um, you know, knock on wood, it's, it's a USA Today bestseller, which is yeah, really exciting. So amazing. That's yeah, just amazing. So, yeah, it really makes my heart happy, but you can get it just the traditional places like amazon.com, um, Barnes and Noble, Indie Books. Um, so, you know, any of those places is available. And, um, and, and, and also if you're kind of not ready to, and, and by the way, I have a whole chapter on cancer in my book. Um, just, you know, in case you want some of the more details. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, if you want to check out my website, which is brundybrody.com, that, that's B-R-U-N-D-E, B-R-O-A-D-Y.com. So what I have on the website is kind of an overview of calcium ATPase, but my, what might be more relevant to you is if you take a look at the newsletters, it gives you a lot of practical information. In fact, I have one newsletter on cancer. Um, but the, the newsletters and the blogs kind of bring it down to practical application. So I, I highly recommend checking that out if you're interested in learning more, um, you know, just, just for your own, just for your own knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Any other questions before we sign off here? I do want to keep it within the, uh, the one hour for everybody. So it looks like everything's done. Brandy, again, thank you so much. It's, you're such a wealth of information. I'm so happy that you, you came on uh, the webinar with us. Well, thank you so much for having me and um, good health to everybody. Okay, and we will tell everyone's giving great webinar. Thank you so much. So people are really appreciating the time you take. So we'll talk a little later, you and I. Everybody thank else, thank you for taking your time out here on a, what are we, Wednesday? On a Wednesday afternoon. Um, such an important topic. And again, yeah. and just to know if anybody has any specific questions and wants to know more, you know, have Kathy contact me because my whole goal is to help educate. So I'm totally open to questions and am willing to take the time to answer them. Perfect. Yep. Wonderful. So everybody, again, thank you for joining us. Everyone, you're very welcome. And um, we will, I have other webinars coming up with other wonderful guests like Brandy. And thank you for joining us. And Brandy, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Okay, bye.